I'm there to steer the ship, but I don't know how to be a DP. I don't know how to be a production designer. I don't know how to do wardrobe. I, I the, the, my job is to, and I don't know how to act. I can't tell Simon Pegg how to act in a scene. He's, no, he's forgotten more about acting than I'll ever know. But so all I do is try to communicate my vision and communicate what I'm trying to accomplish in, in, in as much detail as I possibly can and then allow these other artists to interpret it because they're better at their job than I am. Hi, I'm Jen at Film Forums and with me today is Adam Siegel, writer, director, extraordinaire, the enigma that is Adam Siegel. Today, we're going to be talking about your latest film, Nandor, Fodor and the Talking Mongoose. So mm -hmm. before we get into it, I think we need to tell people to go watch the film first because we don't want to have any spoilers on here. Absolutely. Go watch the film. It just came out on Amazon Prime there in the UK. So you all you Brits can watch it. Brilliant. So my first overriding question is, what inspired this film? Where did it come from? Uh, well, it's a true story. And I first heard about it on a radio show about 10 years ago, just totally randomly. Um, they just mentioned Nandor, Fodor and Jeff. And I was like, what? And I, I kind of would, as I was, you know, over the years making other movies and I would have meetings and talk, you know, people in the industry all the time. And I would always say, I got this talking mongoose movie. And they always looked at me like I was insane. And then I had this weird experience with a with a person in my life where she made this decision kind of very much based on her religion over the the happiness of people in her life and it kind of made brought a bunch of these questions of mine about religion and happiness and faith and for some reason it led to it led me back to the mongoose story and i thought man i don't know why I, it, it just became this thing in my mind of like i need this pertains to the mongoose, like this is it. And so those, when those two things married each other, I was ready to tell the story. I didn't want to do like a traditional biopic that just like depicts exactly what happens. It has to have the subtext for me to have any interest in telling it, so. Yeah, brilliant. And what I would say is when, you know, your writing is clearly inspired uh, by language, you are, you are a linguist in the way you write um, and, there are elements of the dialogue that as someone who is not a native Brit, I'm wondering how did how did you get it to run so smoothly that it's so authentic? Was what we see on screen, is that it, as it was in your final screenplay or is there input from the actors? Well, there's a couple answers to that. There, there are portions of it that, a small portion of it is taken directly from like notes that were actually created by Dr. Price, but that's a quick section. Honestly, the my my real true answer is that Brits speak English the way it should be spoken. Like Americans speak a really bastardized version of this language. And I do too, because I, you know, when I'm talking in a normal conversation, I I speak in, in, an, in an American dialect, but I read and I think a lot in a more literary, honestly, more intelligent dialect, which I think that Brits naturally speak. And so writing in that style, that honestly, almost all of my writing is actually more British than American in the perspective that I don't use a lot of like American slang and a lot of sort of American shortcuts. And so really that's all it is, is like, speaking you know writing english properly and using words that americans don't often use it it, it feels more british that's the truth mm -hmm. so when you were writing this after the inspiration and uh life changes that made you finally put pen to paper did you immediately know who was going to play each character the 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 main ones or was this something that came later no that never happens for me honestly like I don't write because also my scripts are usually very story driven they're not like more character driven like the characters serve the story rather than the other way around and it's a different way of writing like there's a lot of extremely successful and beautiful films that are character pieces where the story doesn't matter as much 
I'm much, I just can't think that way. Mine are much more story driven. And usually they end up with really cool characters to fit the story. So I think more of how it'll look and how it'll feel and what the, the pacing will feel like and the scenes on screen. But I have these kind of faceless characters in my mind. And, but one, once I, the script is done and I start talking to my producers and talking to my casting director, then it's like instantly I know, you know, like on this one, uh, the, the, the only sort of like really strong feeling I had about Nandor himself was that I wanted him to be funny and dramatic, like be able to seamlessly go between comedy and drama. And so when Simon Pegg was one of the first names that was mentioned, I thought of this scene in Shaun of the Dead where he's like crying and then he's make, still making you laugh. And I was like, oh man, like that's that's what I want. And that was perfect. And then I was like, okay, this is perfect. And and then like it for sort of randomly, Simon had like just done this like photo shoot where he was like, looked like, like Sherlock Holmes. Like it was really cool. And I looked, I was like, oh my God, like, yeah, this is it. So yeah. And then the rest of the cast kind of came into place. And all that I really wanted for the supporting characters was really great British character actors. That was like, as far as I had gone, there was actually only one character that I had an actor in mind for like, and it was the, the character of Mr. Irving. And I really wanted Matt Berry to play that role. And okay. And, you know, it didn't work out. He was shooting a show for Disney. And then, but his team suggested Tim Downey. And I was like, oh my God. And and honestly, like that performance is one of my favorites in the whole movie. Like he just makes me laugh the whole time. And so it all worked out. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. Tim is, he still, he steals each scene really when, when he's in it. He's amazing. Absolutely phenomenal. And one thing that I pick up on um, as, um, you know, someone who works in this industry is I see your framing, um, your choices. Obviously, you would have had to work very, very closely with your DOP. Um, For me, I can see your inspiration of David Lynch in your films, without a doubt. And there's so many moments where, you know, you're going into something or you're looking out of something, um, particularly the, the holes and... So had you already decided on all these aspects? Had you got like the storyboard in your head of how it needed to be? Was that a collaboration with your, with your DOP? Yeah, I mean, the way I put a movie together creatively is, so Sarah is amazing. I mean, she's like so brilliant. And she and I work together really well because she, like DPs are tricky because there's a fine line between a dp who can't achieve what you want and a dp who's so good and so wants to be a director that like you'll fight with them all the time so so it's it's actually difficult to find a dp who is amazing but also who will interpret my vision the way that i want to do it and bring their own understanding of how to do that so the way that i the 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 way that I shot list a movie is I I have an idea of like which shots I'm going to need to cover a scene, but I don't really shot list it that way. Like my, my DP is going to know that everybody knows that, but I have the, the subtext of what's going on in the scene. And I, so when I talk to Sarah, I say, okay, look, this is what's going on in this scene. How do we accomplish that with photography because i'm not a dp and i and that i came from i came from the writing side into directing rather than the film the shooting side into directing so i just say okay look this is the this is what's going on this is the emotional tone this is the subtext how do you think we should shoot this or i'll say this is what we were blah i was thinking maybe this way usually throughout the film i've got maybe like 10 to 15 shots that i like see in my head and i'm like for this i want to do a tracking blah 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 you know whatever and so like we'll go those kind of provide some actual like hard shots that we're going to do but then the rest of it i just kind of make it a collaborative effort with her because quite frankly like 
if I have a scene where there's like a, a very sort of heightened sense of tension, like I don't, I know how that should feel, but I don't know how to accomplish that. And she does because she's amazing. And so I communicate that to all the department heads and say, look, like this is what's happening in this scene. Is there anything we can do via wardrobe or via makeup or via production designer, via photography that can help to augment that or achieve that? Yeah. And that does bring me on to production design because everything you see on screen in every frame is there for a reason. Yeah. And yeah. I could try to psychoanalyze this <laughs> but that defeats the point of it the whole I I my understanding is that there is a way to interpret this independent on the where and where you are in your life and I think that's what is so magic about this film because to every different viewer it's going to mean something else but looking at production design there is clearly some choices there that have been made for reasons that oh, yeah. I may not have sussed out um yeah. Talk to me about how how you came to your decision with you know the themes, the colors, uh, the way things are laid out, and the cake. I need to know about the cake. The What's cake. going on with the cakes? The cakes. Oh, the one they're eating. Oh yeah. The all all of the pastries pastries on scene on screen were were by were made by like the mother of one of our crew, which was amazing. She like delivered wow. them to set and like had all the little tarts and stuff like that. And so she made that cake for us and it was beautiful. And, and Andy is, Andy is, was my production designer. And I mean, he was just an absolute beast. I mean, he made the, the budget of this film look so much bigger than it was. And he, you know, I can't even honestly take credit for some of the subtleties with the production design. They were him. I mean, honestly, like he, I, I came in, you know, there was a, there, there's, even in the um, in the the Irving's house, there's like a snake, you know, and he's like the snake is the 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 enemy of the mongoose, you know. And, and I was like, I didn't even think about that. And so he did so much really cool stuff like that 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 he would tell me, and I was just like, oh yeah, this is brilliant. But again, like that's kind of like my philo general filmmaking philosophy is like I'm there to steer the ship, but I don't know how to be a DP. I don't know how to be a production designer. I don't know how to do wardrobe. I, I the, the, my job is to, and I don't know how to act. I can't tell Simon Pegg how to act in a scene. He know he's forgotten more about acting than I'll ever know. But so all I do is try to communicate my vision and communicate what I'm trying to accomplish in, in, in as much detail as I possibly can, and then allow these other artists to interpret it because they're better at their job than I am. And they'll, they will, if they're good, know how to interpret that better. And they will check with me and get, ask my opinion about things and stuff like that. But I do trust them as artists, you know, to, especially somebody like Andy, who's done so many films and who's so good. And they, you know, I kind of just give him free reign to do these things. And if I don't like something, I'll tell him. But in general, he knows we, there's so there's very little like me being like, whoa, 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 what the hell is this? Because I've communicated my vision ahead. I'm really big on prep and with communicating with my crew and my actors so that they know yeah. what I'm trying to accomplish. So I, I think that shows in the final piece, you can see that everything is intrinsically linked which then moves on to sound design which that piano oh I've actually yeah. messaged your um sound uh head of sound to say can't if you got the manuscript for this because I want I want to play that on the piano but it's beautiful oh yeah the tune the tune so, yeah so oh. Bill, Bill my Bill my composer is so amazing and he came to set he flew out to England while we were filming and I remember he came out probably like week two and he was, he played it for me on the phone. He had it on his phone. He had played it. And I was like, Oh, fuck, that is it. I was like, that's so yeah. cool. Like, and, and I was like, that's the theme for the film. Just build it from there. And then we played it for Simon and we played, and we were like, Oh yeah, this really feels like this movie. So you had that before, before she, you had oh, that. Oh, on set. That's yeah. It. He had it on set. He came to the, to, to the, to the location, to the house in the middle of nowhere. And he was kind of absorbing, which is what you should do as a musician. Like yeah. he got the feel of the film and he was watching the monitor and it was beautiful and it worked out so perfectly. And it was stuck in my head the whole time I was 
doing you know post and everything and na, 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 na. it was it was amazing and and i couldn't have been happier i mean he's, he's an absolute beast like i love that guy he's so good so good at, at, at and music really made a huge difference in this movie. Absolutely. And and obviously sound is an important aspect to the film because that's exactly what is being questioned within the the story. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had the luxury of hearing it in the cinema because you lovely, jubbly fella invited me to the premiere a couple of weeks ago. Um, but I've watched it again since on, on my TV and you do get the benefit of the throes of the sound yeah. you do still get yeah. the benefit of that even though you're not in a cinema and it's amazing again it makes you question it takes you on this journey and mm. so to, to kind of like round it all up obviously I haven't even mentioned as well you're writing you have got quotes from Jeff the actual yeah. Jeff oh there. yeah and uh, nods to certain poetry in there that um, is of the time that mm. questions life death and the meaning of 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 it all and the the fragility of it all and i guess this is the overriding theme that people could take from it or we could just look at it as a fun film about a talking mongoose no i mean i didn't want it to be a fun film about a talking mongoose I, like you know i've obviously i've had two premieres for this movie now and those are the only reason i like premieres i don't care about you know the the prestige of a premiere the only reason i like a premiere is that i get to talk to people right afterward who just watched the movie and i got you know at the la premiere i had it was like 500 people there and and i had so many people come up and just say oh man it was amazing the photo the dp you know it was great it looked great it sounded great simon's great and i'm like okay cool thank you but then i probably had like 15 or 20 people who came up and they were like you know there was this line in that scene when he said this and it really made me think about this and, th and that's what I care about. Like, I'd rather people like get some, get something from it. Like that's my whole intention as an artist is like to try to get people to look at things slightly differently and reassess their their life because you know, but not in an over in an uh, overbearing way. Because I feel like a lot of my honestly like opinions and life choices and style and everything are influenced a lot by movies. They are and. But not by like unsubtle movies that have a clear message where they're trying to hit you over the head with this message. Nandor, the message of of this film is it's not it doesn't have a defined answer. Like it, it, it's basically what I was trying to to communicate is the relationship between cynicism and faith and happiness. And how those things relate to each other, where like Nandor represents ultimate cynicism and he's miserable and the Irvings represent ultimate faith and they're happy and they're satisfied with this, this sort of Jeff myth. And so I've always considered myself more of a Nandor in that I'm very cynical and have always had a lot of trouble buying into religion and faith and, and like turning my rational brain off enough to have somebody be like, guess what? When you die, you're going to heaven. And to be like, okay, and just accept that and not think about the like logistical aspects of that that seem impossible. But that doesn't make me happy. Like that doesn't give me, that doesn't help me sleep at night to think that that's not the case, you know? So it's kind of like, what what's the, the nature, the nature of happiness? It's like, what gets you up in the morning and what gets you to sleep at night? It's like, how do you make it through your days? And if you make it through your days by accepting things that can't really be proven, like, okay, you know, that that's fine. Like, and so, but, but like, so those are the, the, they're not like, this movie is more about questions than it is about answers. And that's why at the end, what I was trying to accomplish with the very last shot, which I didn't quite nail was I wanted to track around Jeff to just almost reach his face and then cut out because I didn't like if we use Jeff as an allegory for God which whatever it can be like you some people I know who have tried to explain to me the virtues of Christianity have said like I felt God I've seen God in the, and I'm like mm, okay did you like what what actually happened and I so I feel like even somebody who has had a legitimate religious experience 
you never get it all. You never get this. God does not. I, I cannot. I, there's no person who some God has stepped out of whatever sky he's come to and looked him in the eye and said, hey, guess what? You know, they might feel something in some moment. And so that was what I was kind of trying to accomplish with that last exact shot is you'll never see the face of God. You'll 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 maybe see his his whiskers or his ears or something like that. So, yeah. Loved it. Loved it. And I'd say um, people should watch all the credits through to the end and put on subtitles because there's something that is not audibly heard but comes up in subtitles. I don't know if you're aware of that. Oh, I'm talking, uh -huh. I think I think there might be some sort of message from Jeff about his time it's working with you. Uh, very it's interesting. Possible. Yeah. Very possible. I, I found it fascinating. Yeah. I mean, what I wanted to do with the, you know, it, with the end credits is to, I put in actual like pictures and stuff from the real incidents. And that that's something that like, you know, also too, I hope people will, watch the movie and go and research a little bit about what happened because like the story is insane and it's so much bigger than what I depicted in this film, which was honestly just a tiny portion of that story. And that story is just a tiny portion of Nandor and the, the crazy things that he investigated. There were other very odd ones. And, you know, I, the Jeff thing is, is just fascinating. And it, I feel like there's like a, a, cult of Jeff that exists out there and existed before this film. And this film has definitely brought more attention to it for sure, but it was out there. You, Jeff had a Twitter page prior to, to this movie already. And, you know, there was a heavy metal band called, you know, called Jeff. Like they, they, like there were people who knew this sort of niche story about Jeff and the Isle of Man. And I encourage people to look at, at it more because it is, it's crazy. And I'm obsessed with these bizarre incidents in history that have no explanation and that is ultimately the point i guess the point of the message is that is what we are as humans we are the stories that are left the legacy that's left we are what we leave behind and yeah that's, i guess that is your legacy said, yeah. yeah and that and again that part pertains to like like when when trying to consider the motive of the Irvings because that's that was a big point for Nandor and for doc, Dr. Harry Price and for everyone like it's the first question that a rational person will ask when they look at this whole story and they're like wait a minute like they weren't charging people to come do this this there was no benefit to this for them so like I thought of my, my sort of like you know meta explanation for it was like here I am making a movie about it you know, of 60 years, 70, 80 years later with Simon Pegg. Like that in itself creates a legacy and it is something that makes them unique, again, among the people on this planet that they have this alleged talking mongoose in their barn. And they, in that particular moment in history, it caught fire and became a thing. And that's really the only explanation that makes sense in the end. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. And finishing with a movie and a movie as well so so self-aware right. <laughs> love it love it thank yeah. you thank you mr seagull for talking to me today Mwah! you've thank been brilliant and, um any final words for people to encourage them to go and see your lovely film that feels very very british even though you're not british at all uh just go see it. The performances are amazing. Si Honestly, it's worth it seeing for Simon and Minnie and their chemistry and their performances are so great. The actors are amazing. Everything about the film works in the way that I wanted it to for the most part. And I hope people like it. Awesome.